Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. <laughs> Let's go. Hi guys. Uh, Mike loads test test seven. Iconic weapons of the Peninsula War. So Peninsula War is that the uh, Napoleonic War wars on the uh, ta on the uh, Iberian Peninsula, or is that something else? Yeah, it is. It's Napoleon. Okay, I was right. I was correct. My name's Connor. If you're new, I'm about to lose the camera. I like to learn about things. I just woke up, even though it's like noon. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that. Link to the Discord. Wow, history hit is shooting up. I think they just got like 3,000 subscribers in one day. Which is very nice. They're going to be at a million in no time. Um, Preemptive like. Let's go. One of the first things Wellesley did was join forces with part of the Portuguese army. Initially, this new... So is Wellesley and Wellington the same guy? Arthur Wellesley. Yeah, Wellington. Um, Waterloo, obviously. Yeah, okay. So Wellesley and Wellington are the same guy. Okay. New Anglo-Portuguese army recruited around 2,500 Portuguese soldiers. The Portuguese army was short of weapons, but the British had brought additional guns to equip them. Nothing characterizes the warfare of the Peninsula War quite so much as the rifle brigades. Wellesley famously and affectionately referred to his Portuguese riflemen. So the, the, the Peninsula War, that's what, um... Uh, sharp with Sean Bean. That that's what it's there. They are right. Wellesley famously and affectionately referred to his Portuguese riflemen, the Casadores, as my fighting cocks. The rifle of choice was the Baker rifle. This is an original for you. It's a model uh, pattern 1805. 1805, and it's it's a really good weapon. It just comes into position nicely. It's a relatively short barrel for a rifle, so good for sniping activity. This shorter because they, they fought between the bushes and everything. Wouldn't that make it more difficult for sniping? And guerrilla warfare was a big thing on... Uh, you know, needs a shorter gun. The snipers. The snipers. Three small lead lamps uh -huh. to, to put inside the barrel. Okay. And then you can see the, the rifling. Inside yeah, of the bore, okay? <laughs> okay, so you've put illumination okay. in and... Oh, wow! There are seven grooves. <laughs> that is... There's something about looking down a barrel is... Extraordinary. I can really see the grooves in yeah. there. It makes the ball spin. And a spinning yeah. ball... More accurate. ...is more stable. And by being more stable aerodynamically, it's not only more accurate, it also shoots further. So. I mean, compared to a smoothbore smooth musket, that's, I yes. mean, a smoothbore brown bass shoots, what, 40 meters? 40 meters, Top. maximum. Maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The Baker, 300 meters. 300, meters. so this can shoot 300 meters. Question. But only... When did they first switch to the p more pointed bullets that we know, that we have today? Like, away from the musket ball to the um, more aerodynamic bullet? If you use force ball. Only that. Explain the difference between yes. forced ball and counter, because it depends on the situation, doesn't it? Exactly. Breach loading, the, maybe? The riflemen, or the casador, Portuguese caçadores, or 95 rifles, yes. can use two types of uh, ammunition. For fast firing is normal, normal musket, you know. So just that, a cartridge to that? I can see that's got the yeah. ball in the cartridge and powder. The, is the cartridge and powder you see? Okay, so I can see. So you, yeah. it's got the ball. It's the ball. There's the powder. The powder yeah. It's all wrapped up. Normal. You pop that in. That is normal. And that explodes and, yeah. and sends that out. So then for once the enemy's close, yeah. you don't want long range. No. You, you want quick. You want quick, quick, quick. Is, quick. You use that. You, you use know. that. However, when using the Baker rifle at long range and to gain the maximum effect from the rifling, you need. If it, if he already had. If he already had the powder in the thing, then why did he just put more? To use forced ball 
a lead I gotta shut up. Effect. I gotta shut up. Okay. However, when using the Baker rifle at long range and to gain the maximum effect from the rifling, you need to okay. use forced ball, a lead ball with a patch. And the patches are kept in here. So in the in the butt of the rifle, there is a little patch box, very clever little design, and you need that. Yeah. And you need the ball. Because the idea of this is you put the patch there and the ball, and that, oh, that's tight. That really has yeah. to be forced, that's why they call it forced ball. And that is what's gonna make it spin. Yeah, spin inside, yeah. Because it's so tight in there. Yeah. It being so tight, I, I, I wonder, obviously the tighter it is, that means that the gas, all of the gas, it can't escape around the bullet, the projectile. And so all of it is going to be pushing the bullet. And, and so you'll have a more efficient... Uh, but at the same time, I, I'm surprised it, it doesn't like shoot out of the side of the mid barrel because it gets like lodged and can't go anywhere else other than just explode the gun. Um, but another thing about the Baker rifle, because it was very much used by snipers, they're shooting um, from cover, they had all sorts of extraordinary shooting positions. Sometimes you would see them shooting on the ground with their feet crossed, using their feet like that. As, as, as a gun rest. I think you've got to be pretty careful that that doesn't ricochet yeah. back into your face. Sometimes True. they would shoot using their shako, shako. Their, their, their headwear to, to rest on. Other times they're here shooting on their knees and other times they're standing to shoot. So lots of different positions, exactly. different ammunition. It's really adaptable according to the situation. Situation, exactly. French infantry always attacked in columns, relatively narrow but very deep lines of men. The idea was that they could smash through the enemy. It was quite effective, it was very powerful, although the limitation was they couldn't bring much fire power to bear, only... And wouldn't that mean that you're kind of more like a direct cannonball shot to that line is going to be more deadly because it's, it's so deep, right? in the front line. The defense for the British and the Portuguese and indeed the French was three lines of muskets. That is until the Battle of Vimeiro. Wellesley decided to put his men into two lines. You can see what's happened. The ranks have broadened and you're bringing much more firepower onto the battlefield. And I think you're less Obviously, there's a bigger chance of someone getting hit by a cannonball, but if someone is, it's not going to annihilate, like, ten people. This was a new system, pioneered here for the first time, and Wellesley used it throughout the Peninsula War and all the way up to Waterloo. Fire! And under this relentless barrage of musketry, the French broke and turned, pursued by the British with fixed bayonets. Next, Junot sent in two battalions of French grenadiers, crack troops. They faced a blistering barrage of Anglo-Portuguese artillery. Artillery was the real workhorse of the Napoleonic battlefield. The standard ammunition was this round shot. I've got to put a glove on because this is actually original ammunition that was found here on the battlefield. That that's a three-pounder, the same size that comes out of a cannon like that. You can have three-pounders, six-pounders, nine-pounders, twelve-pounders, huge, great balls. But bigger is not necessarily better because there's all sorts of factors, like moving your gun around the battlefield. The smaller the gun, the more quickly you can move it around the battlefield. The, the fewer horses you need to move it on campaign. So these three-pounders were used a very great deal these smaller balls question are... guys i heard horses don't really eat grass like i heard like one one benefit of having like an ox over long distances and travel is that they can feed off the grass wherever you're traveling and i heard horse need more like like hay and more hard to come by let me know if i'm wrong about that grape shot used a Ooh, very great shot. deal these smaller balls are grape shot. 
you would have mm, 10, 12 of these in a bag. Obviously, they work at much shorter range, but they scatter. And similar to grape shot is this canister shot. Now, this isn't original. This, this is a model, but you can see how it works. It's, it's a canister. It's a canister shot, that, case shot, and it's got I, I, I have lots. a question. I have a question. I have a question. I, I understand how that works, but with the grape shot, what I understand is... It's a grape shot at much shorter... Mm, 10, they scatter. This isn't. And obviously they work. Were, it was in a bag, deal. right? Mm, 10, 12 of these in a bag. Is that the, the problem with that? I see with that is that if you have a bunch of those balls in a bag, in a barrel, then there's going to be so much space for the gas to escape around the ball without really pushing it out. And so I understand how the canister shot kind of fixes that problem by putting it in a, in a canister that fits uniformly with the barrel, but I don't know how a grape shot would have... I'm sure some of them would have just, like, fell right out of the... Obviously, they work at much shorter range, yeah. but they scatter. And similar to grape shot is this canister shot. Now, this isn't original. This this is a model, but you like can see shotgun. how it works. It's, it's a canister. It's a canister shot, case shot, and it's got lots of little balls in it. It's like a shotgun, so yeah, you get this, this spray effect. Much shorter range, but terrible anti-personnel weapon, but not as terrible as this. This is an original piece found here on Vimairu battlefield of shrapnel. This is exploded shrapnel casing. It wasn't the first time it was used, but it's the first time the French faced it. And it was invented by a British artilleryman, Sir Henry Shrapnel. Faria, how does it work? Uh Shrapnel. I don't know why. I always just like it sounds like scrap metal. So I, it's one of those things that I didn't expect it to be named after a person, but obviously it is. This is the model of the shrapnel uh -huh. or sharp metal, or and uh, as you can see, they are fired not from a normal cannon, Much from, from a, a witzer. It's a bigger, bigger, wider How one. Sir? Well, inside of this ball, uh, iron ball is a fuse okay and there are, which is something like this so a fuse like that that's a fuse that the artillery men can cut to explode this at D a different interval range necessary so in effect that's a timer is a timer yeah is exactly is a timer is uh, 50 meters 100 meters 200 150 meters you know the and then in the and it's like that's awesome. There, there are really sophisticated bombs fired from aircraft that do this, right? Like, they explode like a hundred feet above the target and send a bunch of... Like, I thought it was much more primitive. Like, it, it explodes when it comes in contact with the ground or a building, and then all of the metal inside it shoots out. But it actually explodes in the air for like an area of effect before it even hits the ground. That's awesome. Like that, that's like in the American national anthem, isn't it? Bombs bursting in yeah, air. Yeah, exactly. Because it was well, just two years later, Brother, two years yeah, later, at Fort McHenry, yeah. they were using shrapnel yeah. to, 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 to bomb. Bombs bursting in air, say true. To show you know inside this. Aha. This is the shrapnel. So you this see is the fuse, and this is bo uh, musket balls, you know. And is it packed with gunpowder inside of it? So... When that fuse burns down, yeah. this is packed with musket balls and gunpowder, yeah. and the whole thing Burst. smashes, and yeah. you get the musket balls flying, yeah. and that's genius. The jagged casing, everything, which tears yeah. into flesh yeah. and does, does terrible in damage. the air, in the air, in the air, Bombs because the infantry air. goes here and this explodes in the air, so a shower of balls came from the air to the. That could be. I didn't know that there was. Um... Obviously, they don't have machine guns or Gatling guns or, you know, anything like that. But I didn't know they had... I, that must have been devastating. If, if you have... Especially, like, this is still a time where there are a lot of, you know, people marching in formation. If you just get, like, ten of those guns and just raining down the, the shrap metal, that must have been incredibly devastating for infantry columns. The infantry, man, you know, is terrible to the infantry. The French are very afraid of this. As the howitzers rain shrapnel on the French, 
Juno is still waiting for Brenier's brigade to arrive at the battle. In the meantime, he sends General Kellerman with a large force on a much shorter flanking manoeuvre. And this brings them into the village, down the street and past this church. The main battlefield is over there, so Juno's army is there. He sent his men around this way. They're coming down this street to try and get behind the British army. But the British had seen this move, and they sent men to man this churchyard. Now, I know these guys are in Portuguese uniforms. That's OK. We're all on the same side. But it serves to illustrate the point. You can see what a strong defensive position this is. There was actually British troops on the other side of the road as well. And for quite some time, this village, this churchyard, was the scene of fierce fighting, of fierce urban warfare. Stop. Thank you. Obrigado. I bet the neighbours must love us, but it really gives me a sense of what a tremendous defendable position this is. This is not the original wall, but there was a wall here, and the French could not scale it. Not only were there British walls... Who's the boss of? here and the French could say? not scale it. Not only were there British forces here, but there was a company of foot guards just up the road in the cemetery and after a short firefight they fixed bayonets and charged. Vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting right here in these streets. But eventually the Anglo-Portuguese army pushed the French back and out of Vimeiro. Don't the uh, Portuguese and English have like the oldest um, alliance or treaty or, or something like that. Next, with the command, now 20th, now is the time, Wellesley ordered the 20th Light Dragoons to charge. Around 500 cavalry, half British... I always forget what Dragoon is. Oh no, hold on. Dragoon was originally a class of mounted cavalry who... Cavalry who Used horses of, for mobility, but dismounted to fight on foot. So they, they weren't exactly cavalrymen. They were just foot, foot soldiers that were incredibly mobile because of the horse. Okay. For some reason, I, had, I thought it had to do with the guns they carried. Coerce someone into a member of any civil crime in the British Army. Um, where, where was I? Okay. British and half Portuguese attacked heroically, but they were vastly outnumbered by French cavalry. Their British commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Taylor, was killed in action. I thought that, that looked like, um, who's the guy who died at Trafalgar? Nelson. Am I imagining? Juno was still waiting for Brenier's brigade to engage, but they were still somewhere way over there with their heavy artillery using the good roads. So meanwhile, he sent Solignac's brigade to attack the Anglo-Portuguese left flank. And they had to climb quite a steep slope, really quite similar to this tent. So they can see along the ridge, there's, you know, fairly thin Anglo-Portuguese defense, and they think they're going to be able to plow through them. So the men slog up the hill as fast as they can, and when they get to the ridge, when they get to the top of the hill, that is what faces them. Anglo-Portuguese firepower. 3,300 of Wellesley's men are there on what's known as the reverse slope. This was a new tactic that Wellesley tried at Vimeiro, a tactic that he used throughout the Peninsular War. It means that here's your main forces. The enemy coming up... Is he trying to hide his forces? Like it... Yeah, it seems to go against what you would think would be a good position. ...here can't see your strength until they get to the top, and then it's too late. Yeah, but what happened? I mean, when they get to the top, then they're just gonna. I mean, you might kill a few guys, and the. But aren't they just gonna retreat back down the hill? It was certainly too late for the French. After enduring a withering volley of musket balls, they broke and ran. 
Brenier arrived at that moment, but his men were exhausted, outnumbered, and soon defeated. While this was all going on, Wellesley's superior officer, Sir Harry Burrard, had arrived at headquarters and assumed command. Wellesley was keen to push home the advantage he had won on the field, but to his frustration, Burrard determined it would be too risky to pursue the enemy. He ordered Wellesley's army to stay put. This house across the road was turned into a field hospital for the British and Portuguese wounded. The British and Portuguese suffered 720 casualties, whereas the French suffered 1,800. Awesome as always, history hit, phenomenal. Amazing. I'm a bit more awake too, ready for the rest of my day. Gonna do a few more videos. I forget what, I, I, I have them lined up. Hope you're all doing well, I'll check the recommendations too. I'd love for you to join the Discord, hit all the buttons. See you next time, bye.